preferences? I don't care. Alexis, why don't you come? Sure. Yeah, and then. Good. Hi, welcome to Park Avenue Armory. I am Heather Lubov. I'm the Chief Development Officer at the Armory. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our stunning Board of Officers room, uh, which just opened last week after an extensive restoration. I do think this is truly one of the most beautiful rooms in New York, thanks to our brilliant architects, Herzog and Demeron. I would also like to say a very warm welcome to all of you who are tuning in uh, to our very first live stream. Um, and you are all encouraged to tweet your thoughts and questions using the handle hashtag MAVAC. Um, we took over the lease to the building six years ago with a mission to restore our landmark spaces as a center for immersive and unconventional art. Massive Attack versus Adam Curtis is a perfect example of the work that we do, giving two extremely talented artists the ability to dream big, to be provocative, and to quite literally, if you haven't seen the show yet, surround the audience with their art. Thanks to the British Council, which has been an incredibly generous funder of the show, as well as the sponsor of the series of talks related to the work, we have a fantastic panel assembled tonight to discuss one of the major issues that Adam Curtis considers in his work, the role of the media. So it is with great pleasure, to, uh, it is my great pleasure to thank and to introduce Graham Sheffield, the Director of Arts for the British Council, who will moderate tonight's panel. Graham is responsible for the Council's global arts policy. He's had a long and distinguished career in the arts, including 15 years as the artistic director of London's Barbican Center, which is Europe's largest multi-arts center. We feel a particular kinship with the Barbican because like the Armory, it's pro it programs in all artistic forms, music, theater, dance, film, spoken word, and the visual arts, and places a very strong emphasis on artistic partnerships and on arts education. Graham also served as the CEO of the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority in Hong Kong, where he led the development of one of the largest arts infrastructures and programming projects ever envisioned. So I will turn things over to Graham. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. And I should say, actually, it's interesting you, you made the... the, the um, the reference to the Barbican is that uh, Alex Poot, who's your programmer here, or your director here, um, worked for me uh, when I was at the South Bank, actually, in the 90s. As some of you may know the Festival Meltdown, which is still going after 20-odd oh, yeah. years. Yeah. I started that in 93, mm -hmm. and Alex came and helped program in 94. And then when we did a festival in, on in the U.S. in the Barbican in 98, um, Alex was our consultant. So... Um, We've, we've been working together for like 20, 20 years, so uh, I'm sorry he's not here tonight, but he may be tucked under the duvet in Manchester um, <laughs> watching this uh, on the live stream. So, hello, Alex. Um, we're very, I think several people have, have said they're going to be watching this tonight, so welcome to all of you, whether you're in uh, the US, UK, or other parts of the world. I think maybe there's one colleague watching from Syria, though it's quite late, uh, from Lebanon, actually, she is Syrian, but from the Middle East, it's quite so it's great to think that this discussion will resonate further than this room. Um, I've certainly always been drawn to, to works of art which comment on and reflect uh, and challenge contemporary and recent history and politics. And um, as such, this piece, which was, I saw in Manchester, um, is a fantastically bold and innovative example, um, typical of the challenging and the risky artistic policy that uh, Alex chooses to follow in his festival direction, both in Manchester as well as here. Um, and I'm assuming everybody here has either seen it or will see it tonight, so I won't be revealing, uh, as it were, the end of the Agatha Christie storyline if I say it's a very, very provocative and challenging take on world history um, uh, uh, post-war through to 20, 2005 Iraq. Uh, I give, unless it's changed since I saw it in Manchester, give or take a few years in either direction. It's almost the history of my history in a sense. So a lot of the images I was seeing, I remember from, from my childhood, not the very, very earliest ones. Um, so in very, very contemporary, intense visual experience and the music formed by Robert Del Nayo of, of Massive Attack 
and the provocative filmmaking. Now, the theme for the panel tonight is not specifically artistic, not a critique of the show as such, but um, we've called it viewing media through an artistic lens dash the power of illusion and the illusion of power. But hopefully we're going to cast some light on the show and its purpose from philosoph philosophical angle, a political angle, economic and journalistic. And joining me to explore the topic, a fantastically distinguished trio of, of thinkers. Um, on my left, Alexis Goldstein, activist, self-described as activist, writer, programmer, teacher, and occupier. A contributor at The Nation, frequent media guest on MSNBC's Up With Chris Hayes, and she tells me recently joined an organization called The Other 98%. Maybe you'll bring that into the discussion at some point, encouraging uh, public democracy. Um, on the far right, Simon Critchley, philosopher and presenter of an excellent series of talks at Brooklyn Academy of Music, self-confessedly as a philosopher, <laughs> quote, interested in everything. Um, and Joyce... Barnathan, president of the International Center for Journalists, a not-for-profit for the advancement of quality journalism worldwide. And goodness knows we need it, I think. It's very much uh, needed, I would have thought, particularly in the UK, actually, at the moment. Um, uh, I must say, I found it an extraordinary show, particularly the, as I'm a musician, of fan overlay of the ironic and contemporary popular music of the period, even finding bits of Peter Grimes, Britain's Peter Grimes, stuck in there. It's quite hard to unpick sometimes some of the, the decision-making, some of the hectoring tone of the piece, the villains all exposed. But whatever you think of it or thought of it, um, it is a virtuoso piece of filmmaking with a brilliant cross-cutting and editing, and the, the whole creative process is, is a fascinating in, in itself. So let's start with the immediate reactions to the work from, from the audience, we've, as it were, the, the panelists who've seen the work in the last few days. Just, just give us your, your headline thoughts on, on, on how, it, how it was for you. That's the best way to start, and then we'll get to everybody in the discussion. And we will have opportunities for Q&A at the end, so please store up your provocative and challenging questions for the panel, and we'll have 20 minutes at the end to, to catch those. So who wants to start? Alexis, you're looking sure. bursting to go. Sure. Um, can I just see who has seen the piece already? OK, about half of them. Half. Um, so I found it very visceral. I think that what I appreciated about it is it, it seemed a political piece with sort of an overarching message, but it was also deeply personal, and it was trying to manipulate our emotions, I felt, because there were a lot of individual characters that we were sort of introduced to and got to know. Um, and it explored a lot of different themes from sort of like our obsession with the 24-hour news cycle to the fetishization of finance and data and the sort of pitfalls and challenges and, and really chaos that, that has come in the wake of it. But what I found moving was the sort of interplay between the sort of pounding music and the lights. Like in particular, there's one moment that I remember, and I don't think this unveils anything for those of you who haven't seen it, where there's gunfire and there's a scene of war and the lights are firing in rapid succession. So as we feel as if we are being ourselves attacked. And there are moments where it's talking about all of us becoming more withdrawn into ourselves and the visions and the visuals of the piece are very dark and the, the music is very dark. And so it's this sort of participatory experience. We're looking at this narration of what the world has become and the sort of cynicism and the darkness that the world has become, but we are brought along, I, I felt, in that journey and made to feel emotionally the same thing that we're sort of being told the world itself has become. And so that was what I thought was, was most moving about it. Did you, did you concentrate on the message or the art? Uh, I, I found them fairly indistinguishable, I suppose. I, if I were had to pick one, I was focused more on the message. But mm. uh, I found it to be a fascinating work of art. Um, I had myself had never experienced anything like this. And when I tried to explain what it was to people, I was, as a journalist, I usually have words to explain it. And I just couldn't put my finger on one thing that it was. It, it was sort of a documentary, it mm. was sort of a concert, it was sort of a visual arts show. I mean, it was a lot of things 
and you know, obviously there, there was a lot of, there was some very strong and interesting storytelling in this thing. So for me, the fact that I was puzzled and struggling to figure it out was actually an exciting thing because I, I, I felt this was a new experience for me as a viewer, a new form of entertainment that was also illuminating. I didn't necessarily agree with the storyline. I, as a journalist, I <clears throat> didn't see it. You notice I did not say this is a work of journalism. I didn't see it as a work of journalism, even though I know the, the creator may see himself as a journalist. But, um, but I did think it was a, you know, an exciting experience of, as a participant and, and a lover of the arts. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really liked it. I'm, I'm, I'm here as the Massive Attack fan. I mean, I'm, I grew up listening to, well, a bit more than grew up listening to Massive Attack. And I don't know how familiar people here and elsewhere are with the Massive Attack phenomenon and what that means. We could talk about that. But, um, and they've got Horace Andy, who is a legend for people like me, Jamaican reggae singer. Uh, and Liz Fraser, who was the lead singer in Cotto Twins, and that sort of stuff. And then, I mean, for the bass sound alone, alone it's worth being in the room. <laughs> the, there's a, I mean, the, the, the sound quality is extraordinary. That's, that's United Visual Arts. So the sound is a kind of immersive totality, and it really is beautiful, because uh, it's incredibly loud, but there's no distortion. So, and then the screens are, I mean, this multiple screen effect is, is terrific. It's a, you know, the, I mean, there are things that it rem <clears throat> reminds me of a little bit, a little bit of, um, of the pieces by like, artists like Mark Leckie, British artist, uh, like Fiorucci made me hardcore, which used popular music and, uh, and, and footage like that. To, but this is, also more kind of didactic as a story. And if you know Adam Curtis's, I guess if you're going to know anything by him, it would be A Century of the Self, which is an extraordinary account of the emergence of the self out of propaganda through the medium of uh, Freud's nephew. It's an extraordinary. And it's also it's a, very, a very particular and didactic history. And this is a very particular and didactic history I see as, as the, the shift from I guess, you know, a kind of post-war world, Cold War world, uh, which was premised upon some idea that there could be change, that individuals could change the world, and, uh, and that was a good thing, to a vision of what he calls repeatedly a managed world or a static world, uh, which is where we find ourselves today. And the kind of linchpin in that narrative is, uh, is Chernobyl and, uh, and the image of the sarcophagus. So it's, it's a kind of um, very personal take on the last 50, 60 years of Western history, let's say. And, uh, and it goes in a very kind of dystopian mm. direction. And, uh, and then, then you come up with a nice conclusion at the end that I won't spoil for people, but I'm not sure whether I buy it. But it tells us um, a very good encapsulation of it. It, it tells us a lot about um, Adam Curtis himself and, and his views, but does it tell us anything about the power of the art um, in the sense that is he saying there's nothing we can do about it or there's nothing that the, that work can do to make us learn lessons from what we've done? Is, is there a sense of, even though the ending tries to be optimistic, is it, is it in a sense a false optimism it was a very peculiar kind of you know i'd like the other people to you know to get a sense of this there's a very peculiar kind of irony you know in the piece that it's all about the development of a world which is 24 7 uh cnn news coverage as it were a world of two, endless two-dimensional images that will not go away and will not die and, um, and we sit for 90, stand for 90 minutes watching images of that world, it, immersed in a, in a kind of nostalgic world, which is the world of massive attack in the 1990s. So I don't know. I mean, there, there, and there was, a, there was an extraordinary moment in the uh, 
in the narrative, which is where he talks about the Taliban mm -hmm. and uh, about Taliban iconoclasm. Because one response to, as it were, a world of images is to just to destroy forbid them. images, destroy them. Well, and that's, an, and without, I suppose, unveiling it for those of you who haven't seen it, that was a particularly moving piece because they essentially show that the Taliban aim to erase all imagery right. and then make a very compelling case for the fact that they were actually very much influenced by the imagery of the American mass media and the apparatus of Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And they sort of present that in a way that is, I, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, but it's, it's very, very moving and very powerful. Yeah. And that's true. You know, I, mean, it's, you know, I remember reading um, um, uh, Osama bin Laden's statement, The, the Towers of Lebanon. Where he talks, it's, this one, it's the one where he talks about the motivation for the 9 11 attacks. And the motivation for the 9 11 attacks was, it was a visual memory that he had of the attacks on the towers of Beirut um, mm. from 1982. So, as it were, 9 11 begins as, as a visual memory. And, uh, you know, we tend to forget there's a lot more we could say about that, about the power of it, the strange power of it. So, I'm not sure whether we're shown a way out. But well, that's, that's, oh, go on. Sorry, I was just going to say, like, I agree with you because it, it, you sort of wonder if we're being punked by the end because there's so yeah. much emphasis throughout the piece about you can be fooled by things that are not real and we present these illusions and then they become reality. And it gives the example of um, Donald Rumsfeld at Meet the Press and talking about how Osama bin Laden is hiding inside this of this bunker. giant, enormous <laughs> right. underground fortress and there's dozens of them just that's like right. this. Yeah. And, and, and then in the end, you know, it's very clear that we have been fooled by this illusion and yet we have crashed and there's no weapons of mass destruction in Iraq either and we're being fooled by the illusion so to what extent is the audience meant to be aware of the idea that maybe we are being fooled by an illusion as we sit here and watch the piece yeah. or not? Yes, I mean I, I found it in some senses quite nihilistic in the sense that the, you know, you're not left with any, any solutions, any better ways out. He's excoriated virtually everything from the extreme right to the extreme left. But and he's you, never actually said what that ideal world is. He's just shown us how we failed over the last 50. But, you know, that said, you know, it, it's kind of interesting that, you know, I could see he had, he had several couples that he picked out, and one of them was, you know, Ted Turner and Jane Fonda. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see the example of Jane Fonda, who was the great change the world fight the Vietnam War, and then she's, you know, Miss mm -hmm. Body Beautiful doing her calisthenics. But Ted Turner, you know, Ted Turner created CNN. Of course, you know, I'm the journalist here speaking. But, um, and I was trying to, I'm sitting there thinking, what was wrong with the creation of a 24-7 news channel? What was, what was the, the heresy in this? Did he, did he feel that the images just got cheapened because they were commoditized or, or what? Um, you know, one of the interesting things as a journalist, I, I mentioned this to you earlier, was that I covered the Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which is shown as one of the great failings of the, of the era. And, um, and I will tell you that this, accident happened, I mean, I know it vividly. I know the day, I know when it happened. It happened on a Saturday, April 26, 1986. Mm. And I was the Moscow bureau chief of Newsweek at the time. We did not know till three or four days later that there, there actually had been an accident. You know, we, we were aware over the weekend that radiation had been flowing somewhere they were capturing it and, and they thought it was Sweden and Sweden shut down its, its, its nuclear power plants and then they said no it's coming from you know the direction I was sitting in and it was like oh my god and I remember when my bosses called me on a Tuesday and said to me um, we're doing a cover story and I said oh okay on what I said on the wor worst nuclear accident in history now imagine imagine that now I mean is this progress that they could hide, people could hide things of that magnitude in that era to us, and we, we were just shut out of the news. So I'm, I'm wondering whether his premise about technology, data, sending of information is actually that horrible a thing. I mean, look at Assad now in Syria. His father leveled a whole freaking town in Syria 
Amat, and nobody could see it, and nobody did anything about it. And now look what his son has done with poison gas, and the whole world is on him. And we have evidence, we have pictures, we have citizen journalism, we have a lot of, so I struggled with his, I struggled with a lot of his uh, vision of, of the world today, and I guess I'm more optimistic. Yes, it's, it's not exactly nuanced, the vision, is it? No, it's, it's very, that's why it's not journalistic. It's not even, there's no other side. It's yes. just, he's got a vision of how dark this world is, and he does a very good job of using multimedia to, to get it across. Mm. But I have to say that, you know, maybe others identified, and I, it wasn't that there weren't things that resonated with me that he said, but it wouldn't exactly be if I were going to write the story, that would be the way I would see the world. Well, I think one of the things that I got out of what he was trying to say about the mass media and the constant cycle was that we are, are sort of observers now, we're spectators, we aren't active participants in our own lives with agency. It's this idea that we're being inundated with data at all times, and it allows us to withdraw into our sarcophagus, which is one of the central themes that keeps coming up. And I actually don't have an answer, I'm curious what the rest of you think, but of, of how to unpack this, because it starts with Chernobyl fairly early on. Chernobyl is mm. itself a sarcophagus. And then later on in the piece, it talks about how we have all become this sort of self-contained sarcophagus. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that he identifies throughout the piece who also withdraw into themselves. There's the scientist who won't leave his hotel room in Reno. There's the daughter of, um, of um, Pauline Boti. Boti, thank you, yeah. um, who eventually dies of a heroin overdose and is sort yeah. of withdrawn into herself. And so there's this like recurring theme of the sarcophagus. And I'm still trying to figure out how to unpack how, you know, Chernobyl, here's this accident that sort of presses outward versus the sarcophagus that pulls inward while we sit and just watch reality. We sit I mean, and watch reality and we take, we take drugs to affect our moods. So there's a little interview with a kid with uh, ADD or whatever and the, the proliferation of the pathologies of the sarcophagus, as it were, and the drug treatments that go along with it. It's interesting you mentioned the, the Chernobyl <clears throat> and the sarcophagus and the fact that if, if they'd still be making this film, they could have sort of reeled in Japan and the mm -hmm. whole uh, Fukushima nuclear plant, which is all happening all over again. Um, but uh, Simon, you had a sort of mini treatise you wanted to deliver on the sort of sarcophagus and, and the kind of... Um, what, is a sarcophagus? Of what is a sarcophagus? What is a sarcophagus and how, how, how do you unpick that? Yeah. Well, because you, you, you could think of a sarcophagus as somewhere you put dead people. But it's not true. Because in Egyptian uh, sarcophagi, there, this, was a, this was a passage to the afterlife. Life didn't end, it continued in some other form. So the sarcophagus is not a place for the dead, it's the place for the kind of undead. Mm. <laughs> and the sarcophagus of Chernobyl is certainly not dead. The, uh, the nuclear gunk in there lives and will live uh, for however long that will live. And then the sarcophagus of data within which we, I mean, the prisons that we build for ourselves with our phones and our the rest of the apparatus that we use are also not going to die, right? Well, and there's that so you, recurring theme you, you, you can drop dead tonight and your Facebook page will still be up and running. That celebrities <laughs> never die. We're watching dead people dance over yeah. and over and over again. And there's that sort of long mo montage of, of people who are no longer with us dancing. Mm -hmm. So we live in this sort of ghost world, right? And, and, and the film is a kind of almost, you know, ghostly nostalgia at times for the ways in which we're inhabited by the past. Which and is almost an afterlife in itself, isn't it? The yeah, and, and, it's, and there's something, you know, I mean, I, I <clears throat> might be the only person here who believes in ghosts because, you know, I believe in theatre and theatre is all about ghosts. Hamlet, uh, Aeschylus is the Persians, and so it's all about, and ghosts are those creatures that refuse to obey the line between life and death. And that can seem like a supernatural thought, but it can also seem like a, you know, we are in an odd situation that we're, we're, we're not, we're flooded. We flood ourselves with data that won't die. And not just data, metadata that won't die. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so, yeah. Um, did the music, you, you, you guys know the music very well. Did the music uh, have that same intellectual component there? Was there a selection of the pieces that, 
fit the fit the narrative that he was saying? Well, that's right. I was going to actually read my mind. I don't think we haven't met before, but I was just going to say <laughs> we're talking about the documentary aspects and historical, but we're not talking so much other than Let's you talk about, about the music. The music, and I, 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 I don't know. What, I, I've got a view on it. I found it sometimes. I found it overwhelming as an experience, but I'm not sure. I found the music in many ways quite nostalgic. Uh, as opposed to the, the, the kind of the rigor of the intellectual debate in the film. Um, how, how does that...? Well, I mean, it is, you know, it's music from the past. Uh, I mean, the most powerful moment, I think, is when Horace Andy, again, this giant of, you know, Jamaican reggae, uh, does Sugar Sugar, the most kind of inconsequential of songs, over footage from a, a British show called The Black and White Minstrel Show, yeah. which you can guess what it was from the from the title, it was an unpleasant kind of, but we grew up watching it and it was perfectly normal that white people would have blackface and dance around on television. So you've got this strange, that strange juxtaposition. So there's a kind of which, the way in which um, things like, I don't know, you can reel them off. The Shirelles, Dusty Springfield, all sorts of yeah. uh, songs are used. And then there's a kind of chronological sequence um, well, there's one, I mean, there's one massive attack moment, which is uh, the track two of Protection, the 1994 album, is, is called Karma Coma, which is uh, with tricky uh, speaking. And uh, I guess there's a kind of point that's being made about being comatose. You know, we're in a kind of karma coma. That's the, what's, what it's like in the sarcophagus of data. And, but the, me, the most powerful musical moment was the... Um, there's, if you, any Bauhaus fans out there, there's an extraordinary moment when Bela Lugosi is dead appears, and just the opening chords are, oh God, it's Bela Lugosi is dead. So there is that nostalgia, um, and I don't know quite what to do with it. You could say it's a ghostly nostalgia, it's twisted, it's, but it is a kind of, there is a temptation to wallow. Yeah, that's, yeah. That, 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 that's what I, I felt, but I'd be interested to keep the discussion going afterwards on that, because I'm trying to convince myself that it could work without out the music just as a piece of documentary journalism. And one thing about uh, the music is the massive attack, why massive attack so hugely important in the history of British music is that they, you know, that they, they appear in Bristol in the early 90s, 91 Blue Lines, the first CD, but they're coming out of the ACC. scene. Bristol is a complex cultural nexus of all sorts of things, strong influences from the Caribbean, all of that. So you've got, um, uh, a musical form which is hugely indebted to black American music, to uh, particularly to reggae, and then to punk and post-punk and all that stuff. That's a kind of mix. The point being, we were talking about this before, is that Massive Attack was something new, right? Mm. It was, it was a, music hadn't sounded like that before, and it was extraordinary. So there's a kind of way in which the, the, the question that we're asked at the end of the piece, which is, you know, go home and do something, you know, you think, okay, I'm going to go home on the subway and do, but is, in a sense, is answered musically, in a sense, music is, is a strange thing where you can take a whole assemblage of traditions and different forms, and at certain moments in history, something new will emerge, like hip-hop emerged here in the mm. late 70s, early 80s. And sure, that's, sure. I thought the venue was really important here, too. The venue, yes. Yeah. To me, the, yeah, I, I thought the fact that they had it in such a cavernous space. Absolutely. And the way it was set up with these 11 huge screens with the band behind the screens and the lighting. I mean, the way it sort of enveloped, you used the word enveloped everybody. Mm -hmm. I, thought it, I, thought the, I thought it was terrific mm -hmm. that the venue was perfect for this kind it of was, event. Well, was, and that's yeah. interesting because it sort of goes back to this idea of what's real and what's not real. If the band itself is behind the screen and we're watching the screen and the music is coming. You know, it's like the man behind the curtain and what, what is real and what isn't. And we don't really sort of interact with them. We can't see them except mm -hmm. through when the light changes mm -hmm. or their image of their face is projected onto, onto the screen. But I just wanted to jump back to something that you said, Simon, about um, how massive attack there was nothing that we had ever heard like it before. Mm -hmm. And that in some ways stands in contrast to something that the piece talks about, which is about sort of the increasing data fetish that we have. You go on Amazon, oh, you bought this, you might like that, or you know, you're on Twitter, you should follow this person because you follow that person and nothing new is being created. But then that makes me wonder, 
you know, massive attack you said in 1994 was like nothing we've ever heard before. And, and what does it mean that we're sitting here in 2013? And is, <clears throat> is, is it meant to reflect back on the immense creativity, or is it meant to sort of come back and, and be a part of that, if you like this, you might like that sort of death of creativity? Or is that a death of creativity? Who I mean? said that's death of creativity? Because you get a recommendation based on things you like in the past. I don't, I don't know, maybe that's advancement. You know, if I can, if I can say, look, I've, I've read these kind of books, but here are 15 more you might, you know, my eyes are open, might read more things that are very interesting uh, that I find compelling. So I'm not sure, his technology data argument just didn't resonate with me. <clears throat> I mean, I got his case, I just didn't necessarily agree with it. You know, Twitter is a revolutionary form of communication. Mm. Twitter is giving us real, what's really happening on the breaking news. It's the breaking news platform. Twitter is revolutionizing the news business. And revolutionizing so, journalism as well. Journalism, I said, the news business, yes. Yeah, and but citizens now own, the, own yeah. breaking news. Well, who, did, who did you read about the Washington shooting from? You read it from, on Twitter first, from citizens who, shoot, who took pictures from inside the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they're being replaced by journalists, but they're now part of this completely new yeah. ecosystem. So I don't know. I, don't, Joyce, I, don't know that I, I was just going to ask you, Joyce, I mean, as a journalist, yeah. you've got in this piece, you've got an artist really invading journalistic space. And he's not invading it um, uh, with the sort of detachment and the objectivity that a journalist normally brings to a story. He's, he's, in, he's invading it with, with, with subjective, opinionated, angry, and very combative material. Now, how does that make you feel as a journalist? I just story? didn't see it as a work of journalism, so it didn't okay. make me angry. I, I, saw it as a, I, I saw him as more of a documentary mm. maker. He had a point. He yeah. found the clips, the people, the stories to tell to make a very strong point. Whether you agree with the point or not, you know, is a, is another story. But I didn't take offense as a journalist. I just he just he didn't he didn't seem to be doing what we do in the best of our trade. Mm. I, I was just going to say I saw it less as an indictment of technology as a whole, and more of a sense of how are we using technology to retreat back into the sarcophagus, and how are we using it to sort of numb ourselves and and just fall back into this spectator like role where we just absorb and consume and there's a clip a very brief clip and i'm not sure who the the woman is but she says i i go to bed and i check the news right before i go to bed so i know what happens and then i wake up in the morning and i look at what i missed and i'm just always watching mm -hmm. um and i think part of the call at the end was this idea of find your own way home don't use google maps to find your way home but this idea of like taking agency back so i don't know that it was an indictment so much of just technology or twitter or the news cycle but the way that we've used it to just withdraw into ourselves. That's how I saw it. Mm -hmm. you Did you identify? Did you say that's me? Yeah, I mean, I, I am a terrible addict of technology and I'm on Twitter entirely too much. And then, but I feel like our drive is to increase our productivity. Like I, I'm in a sphere where I do some writing and you have people like Matt Iglesias who has changed the way that people write and the idea is you're supposed to churn things out really quickly and the, the death of the long read, like we're all so distracted and the more people run faster, the more we're all expected to run as fast as the rest of them. And, and we've sort of seen this, this depth, death <laughs> of doing things slowly and carefully and deliberately. At the, you know, everyone wants to be the first one to report the headline. Right. And that leads sometimes to the headline being reported well, I think, incorrectly. I, yeah, I think the task of, I mean, to be, <laughs> to speak in very bold terms, uh, the task of art is to slow down in that sense. You know, it's, it's the, for me, is what, particularly theatre does, but all movies or music, it, it slows you. It, it's a kind of emergency break. It's a kind of mm. foot on the brake. And you can see what you're seeing at that point. You, know, you can you arrest things for a second, for, for an hour or two, mm. um, or whatever, however long it takes. I think that's crucially important. I, um, I agree with you on this question of agency. We could talk more about this, but a question of technology. <clears throat> I think the relationship between technology an agency and technology and democracy, I think is just a complicated one. Mm. I think we get a very simple line here, which is because it, you know, um, what you said is absolutely true. We have this citizen journalism. We have, and we have incidents that, you know, I know Alexis was in, involved in, things like Occupy, and I was down there as well. And that was something which was both, as it were, 
about bodies in space, about physical bodies in space, but also about mediation and technology at every particular instance. So the, the relationship between technology and democracy, I think, is, is, is it's, it's a complicated story. As we've been sitting here, I've been talking about this, and we're sitting in, in, in New York, um, uh, where I, I just had this vision of sitting the entire, bringing the entire UN here to the Park Armory and playing the, 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 this piece to the UN Security <coughs> Council and thinking what kind of impact and effect that would have on the people that are trying to run the world. It would be quite an interesting audience because we're all, you know, probably of a certain cultural people and coming here for the art and so on, but the, the audience that he's really addressing isn't here. Mm. Yeah, or some members of the US Congress, it would be good to Well, yeah, Congress would be very interesting. Well, yeah. if, if it functioned, if it were open. What? That's right. Well, they're all there. That's right. They're all... Could this, could this kind of work have been written in the States? Is there the kind of interest and the, the kind I of dynamism? I heard that question asked by somebody who had left the room and was talking excitedly with the fellows that were you know, discussing the show. They asked that exact question. I just happened to eavesdrop. Well, would there. you like to try and answer it? <laughs> um, I think, I don't know. I'm, the Ameri I'm one of the Americans here. I don't know. I mean, is the art scene <laughs> here and the cultural scene here uh, absolutely engaged enough to, to write a piece absolutely like this. yeah I mean you've got I mean you know it's a bit I mean it's a, a I was reading Ben Ratcliffe's review in the Times and he compares it to a kind of uh, this could be a kind of a similar undergraduate hit to Koyani Katsu you know yes. that, that, or, or it could be if you think about the documentary making of some like Errol Morris or there's a whole it absolutely could happen here and I think that there's so much cynicism especially on, among the Millennials and my friend Nicole Carty um, who I work with at the other 98 percent was was recently talking about this that they she's uh, you know 25 so she's come of age with 9-11 the financial crisis crossing the one trillion dollar mark in student debt and these are people who sort of like base you know, not what is it 25 percent youth unemployment and so I think that a yeah. lot of the artists especially coming out of the millennials is very similar to what we see in the piece, this sort of deep cynicism about the sort of decades and decades of failure and this inability to really provide the basic services to help people live. Mm. Um, and so, I, yeah, I, I agree with you that I do think, but I don't know, maybe it would, it would probably come from perhaps a younger artist who has just lived through this past decade. Well, it, it, it would hard to be produced by a millennial. I think it had to be somebody who was living through that. Didn't you feel that way? It had to be somebody who was living through the, mm -hmm. that period as an adult and absorbing it. I don't think he, somebody who didn't live in the Soviet era. I mean, my yes. husband was teaching a journalism class and talking about the Gorbachev era and is looking around and you know people are scratching their heads and he says, oh, oh you know, he has to define who Gorbachev is. So, you know, when you're at that stage, I, I don't think that somebody, a millennial, could produce this. Something like it they could produce, and, the, and, the, and it may resonate, but I think this, this obviously has, you know, has somebody who's connected personally with, with these histories. He picked people out that he connected with through this period and, and showed the distress. I suppose I meant not this particular work, but a work of this yeah. kind of genre and the work of that kind of political angle and power. Um. Yeah, I hadn't seen one here, so I, but you know more than I do. But you've seen sort of bits and pieces of visual art and concerts with visual art. But it was sort of this, um, this in interesting storytelling narrative combined with, with the, the concert and the screens and the technology that made it very exciting. I mean, uh, you know, there was a debate going on a little bit in the, in the summer in the UK from one of our playwrights, Mark Ravenhill, who said the arts had somehow become disengaged from politics and, and current issues. And, and so I, for one, disagreed. I, 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 in Edinburgh this summer, seeing every work I saw was about uh, contemporary uh, history in some way, most of it deeply depressing, um, about death, rape, uh, bioethics, um, espionage, uh, you know, they're now making a film about WikiLeaks. Um, mm. uh, you know, so I, I sort of feel that arts are, are getting more engaged um, yeah, rather and, and less the, engaged. The Occupy movement, there was a lot of art that came out of that, and I was at the MoMA with my mother and just so happened to see a bunch of newspapers that a number of my friends helped put together with beautiful graphics in it hanging up on the wall at the MoMA. This was probably a year ago at this point. Mm. But I do think that you certainly do see this reflected in art, maybe not in the more mainstream art, but certainly around the fringes. 
and certainly in, the, in, in uh, I know colleagues from the British Council will, will know, certainly in parts of the Middle East where the social volatility and un uncertainty, the arts are very much on the front line there in some of the, in some of the, the countries, particularly Libya and Egypt. Well, and I wonder if, if part of the message of the piece, and I don't know the answer to my own question, is that art allows you to escape the esophagus. Uh, sorry, the esophagus. Yeah, I don't the know esophagus. how Freudians look at it, the that's, sarcophagus. That's, that's very interesting. <laughs> we can analyze that later. Well, it sort um. of allows, it's sort of, my question was, what's the future for arts activism here? I was directing that at you, so. Well, yeah, I think that it, it's one of those mediums that, uh, corporatism really tries to control and engage in and there's sort of this obsession with making something go viral and how do we make something catchy and everyone was so disappointed i don't know if folks used to follow that twitter account horse ebooks that would just tweet out random phrases and people thought it was so hilarious and apparently <laughs> it's just all a part of some vast marketing scheme and everyone's hearts were broken so there's this attempt to sort of like harness the arts in order to either maintain the status quo or sell you a widget, but it still seems to be, you were talking earlier about how massive the tech just, and, and just the music out of Britain in general just was your greatest export and just Our uncontrollably flows. And, and we were also talking about maybe we should bring up Pussy Riot and how quickly that story spread and the, the, the protest that they had in the church and the, the music itself. And so it does seem to be a mechanism for protest because it, it seems to be in some ways still this uncontrollable force that people respond to and then proliferate and spread. I mean, I mean, British music since, I guess since the, I mean, for me, when I was 12 years old and I saw David Bowie on Top of the Pops performing Starman, in a sense, what happens in British music... Giving away your age now, yeah? I'm 53, so I was 12 years old, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, that moment is, uh, I mean, the people like Bowie, uh, Sid Barrett, uh, Nick Drake and others, there's a kind of um, uh, particular kind of British take on, which until that time had been hugely imitative of what was happening in the US. And it, be, and it also becomes a kind of musical theatre. You know, in a sense, what people don't get about about punk and post-punk and all those strange movements was their theatricality. So yeah. this is, the theatricality of this, in a sense, is, is very interesting in that regard. And it, it's a different kind of, um, a, a different picture of race emerges in the British context and the American context because all these kids like Robert Del Naja are listening to is, is black American music or, or uh, Jamaican reggae. Yeah. And it, it, it produces a different kind of mongrel assemblage that is, that is British music for that, those wonderful decades. And um, I mean, you know, I guess now Simon Cowell has tried to destroy, as Margaret Thatcher destroyed the <laughs> institutions of the welfare state. Simon, what's his name? I can't yeah, his name. yeah, has sort of single handedly tried to destroy popular music as we. I think he's got a lot of help. I don't know if it's just him. He's got a lot of help. Yeah. yeah but he's, the, he's, <laughs> the, he's, the well, he's the principal uh, architect, isn't he? I mean, he's the principal architect. But I, mean, it... I mean, in this, I'm, I'm struck also by the fact that um, that um, that's part of why I made the point about the, the playing it to the politicians in the UN. The, the politicians still have this amazing ambivalent relationship to the arts in the sense that in one sense they're afraid of them, certainly in some parts of the world. And mm -hmm. in other parts of the world, certainly in the UK, there's a sort of a sense that they're being um, not marginalized, but, but pushed into the box of a creative industry so that they're there to provide economic de mm -hmm. growth and development. Right. And to some extent, that seems to me to militate against the arts as a vehicle for new thought, new ideas, inspiration, and the rest. It's something I have to wrestle with sort of every day uh, at home in, in the job where, uh, you know, dealing with government departments that are wanting to see return on investment. And I'm just wondering, this piece of work is, you know, that's never going to produce a return on investment. And yet it's a very powerful medium. And I'm just trying to rationalize those two extremes in terms of the political landscape in which this work inhabits. Do you have any comments on that? 
One thing in particular, they go very hard against Goldman Sachs and the banks, and I happen to notice that this, the season, I hope I'm sure I'll get in trouble for saying this, but the season of the Armory was sponsored by City, and I had to think to myself, <clears throat> is that because they went so hard against Goldman Sachs, or they just didn't watch the piece before they sponsored the entire season of the Armory? Really? It's sort of this delicate, right? Because increasingly we have these corporations sponsoring the arts, and is that going to lead to censorship of the arts, or is... Well, your entire arts ecology in the U.S. is based on uh, donations and, and philanthropy and corporate sponsorship anyway, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I guess I'm, again, the optimist on this panel probably, but, you know, there's a proliferation of nonprofits around this country and proliferation of artistic groups and theater groups and, and the like that, that, you know, go to Indiegogo and you can go and... and um, and invest as an individual in projects that you want to invest in. So I, I, I see lots of, lots of alternatives and, you know, we live in this city, this city that's oozing with this kind of stuff. I mean, I, my, my daughter's in the theater world and she's constantly doing stuff on a shoestring, but it's getting out there and people are, you know, it's, it's a fabulously creative uh, place. So I guess I'm, I'm not as down about this and also, you know, if you go down the west side of our Riverside Park and look 10 years ago at what was there and what is there now, there are works of art almost every 100 feet. If you're a jogger, as I am, and you go down, it's like it's an amazing, it's an amazing jogging experience that you won't have, you wouldn't have had 10 years ago. So I guess I, I think that there are exciting things that are happening too that I don't see it as a, the corporatization necessarily of the arts. I think it's good that there is such a thing as corporate res social responsibility and that, gov that, that corporations are earmarking money for good causes. Um, as, as a nonprofit, I run a nonprofit myself and I take nothing if there are strings attached. And I will tell you that I don't, most of the people that, get, the people that give to, all the people that give to us give with no strings attached. I guess, I mean, I, I see more of a, a relationship between uh, certainly, I mean, popular culture, whatever we mean by that, um, let's say popular music and periods of, uh, of crisis, of, uh, of decay, of, of chaos, you know, so the great periods, for example, of British pop, of, say, punk is a very good example of something that comes out of a, a real sense of national crisis in Britain, chance of the Exchequer going to the IMF to borrow money and the shame involved in all of that. Bin bags in the street, trash in the streets, whatever. But it was also incredibly fecund, as indeed it was in New York in that period, right? Yeah, it the was. Great, the great period of you know, uh, musical fecundity in, in New York was a period of social catastrophe, right? And that's interesting. And mm. I, I tend to think that, you know, in, and that's why, well, Massive Attacker from Bristol, Right? And that's interesting. Bristol is not the capital city. Bristol's sort of uh, to the side of that. And I here I'm interested in, I think I, I place my bets more on the Detroits, the Baltimores, the, those, the, those places where, where things are in a sense, in a sense the, one of the problems with New York is that it's, um, I live in Brooklyn and it's all a bit too, you know, it's, you live a kind of, Parody, well, parody that you can't escape. You know, you have facial hair, you become a parody. You don't have facial hair, you become a parody. You ride a bike, you're a parody. You don't ride a bike, you're a parody. You're a parody, you know, Brooklynite. And in a sense, we live this sort of intense self-consciousness all the time. How many people in the audience live in Brooklyn then? <laughs> oh, practically all of you. That's right, stand up Brooklyn. Um, but it's all, it's all hell. <laughs> but you, it's but, a sarcophagus. No, it's not. But Simon, it's interesting. The, the, point, the point you're making in some ways is that, you know, Bristol, uh, Manchester, to some extent, Liverpool, uh, that was, we were discussing that earlier, Birmingham, certainly. Leeds. Leeds, Gateshead, all these places in, in, um, in, the, in the UK have come back through the cultural lens. And they've all been reinvigorated through creative industries, through culture, through digital media, through new media through experimentation, you say, I mean, is that the way forward in the States where you've got these um, decaying industrial cities? And there doesn't seem any other way other than a creative return for those. Yeah, cities. yeah, and it was, I was in Cleveland a couple of years ago, and it was, you know, I mean, Cleveland is, 
it's kind of, it was kind of fantastic because people are taking over disused blocks, doing urban farming, doing all sorts of extraordinary things. I went to three or four great record shops which had things you couldn't find here. There's a, a real sense of energy. Rock and roll which Hall comes of Fame. In, sorry? Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So, it's, yeah, so I think, yeah. But it's, um, I, I worry about the, you know, the way in which... Um, Pittsburgh, too, has done that. Re yeah. Revived itself, become a cultural center. It used to be a steel town, and it's kind of redefined itself. You know, Andy Warhol museums, Carnegie Mellon taking, you know, creative energy oozing through the city. And so I think you, there are Detroits, and, and Detroit was... You know, Motown, but... I mean, I suppose what I'm angling at is, are we getting answers? You were saying, what do, does Adam Curtis say at the end? What's the way? Are we getting more energy now from city, from city-states, as it were, than from state-states? And is this a way forward that is different from the one that's projected I think in it, the film? I think it is, because I think that, like, perhaps in the past, and the film sort of starts with this, is the, the government tried to change the world, and the government tries to sort of right. set programs and... Uh, they don't mention the Great Leap Forward, but there are all these like examples of great, vast programs that were tried that led to mass devastation. And the sort of things that you're talking about, at least when I think about Detroit and the things that have been coming out of Detroit that are interesting and exciting and artistic, these are all people getting together on their own without support from companies, without support from the government. And if anything, they're being hampered by the emergency state that's been declared and the pensions will be wiped out and their whole city council of democracy has been completely decimated by this emergency manager. But the people are acting autonomously without interference or well not really interference they're being interfered but without help from the government and in some ways the piece i don't know if that's the message of the piece but it starts well, off just with, wondering here's when the government tried to help and it hurt us so terribly and then there's this sort of call at the end that you should you know rise up and have agency and, and is the answer to that that the government should try again and not be so scared of trying to change things because the big there's this big middle part where it's like when we tried to change things things went poorly so we stopped trying to change things and we're just going to manage them and watch them and watch you and there's this sort of invocation of the surveillance state and so one thing that i'm not clear about is is he sort of advocating this kind of anarchist slash libertarian, let's just do it ourselves, kind of Occupy mm -hmm. style? Mm -hmm. Or is it the government should realize that it's okay to make mistakes and we should try to change the world again instead mm. of just being so scared? Or is it both? Is it neither? I don't know. We'll never know because it wasn't developed in this, no. in this presentation, I don't think. Does anybody in the audience uh, d here have a question or point they, they want to make? It's a thought on, on, on what Alexis, I think there's, well, there's... Think about it while Simon's <laughs> making there's, there's it. A, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, reference back to a state-managed, a, 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 a state-based politics that was about change, you know, New Deal here, welfare state in Western Europe. Soviet Communism is another example, and as it were, the, the you could read it in a, in a consistently kind of uh, anarchistic way, in a sense that the, the emergence of this static world, this managed world, uh, which has led to you know, the sense in which the world is a kind of prison and what do we do, has also led to other kinds of possibilities. So where people in interstices, in gaps, do things for themselves. And we've seen that over the last few years in the name of Occupy and the rest. So you, you could read it that way. And I think it's... Um, I, and it I sort of it's slightly fits in what you were saying earlier, Joyce, about the changes in journalism and people are just taking control, aren't they? Um, there's less... Yeah, I think the, it's empowering. It's you know, empowering. The, tech, the, the technology can be scary and can be yeah. self-defeating, can also be very empowering. It just depends on, on how it's used. But in this case, yes. It is empowering. So what future for News Corp and places and people like this? You know, you're going to... It, it... Are you asking about the future of journalism? Yeah, well, I suppose so, yes. <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> right. Well, I, I just think it's, we're in the middle of the revolution now, and uh, we don't exactly know who's going to survive, what's going to come mm -hmm. out of it. But that said, I think all of us as citizens know that we need reliable, contextual, accurate information. We don't want to have to be trying to struggle to figure out whether something that comes across is accurate or not accurate. And so, um, so I think that there's going to be a combination of citizens pl 
putting their input into the system and very valuably when it comes to breaking news. But also, you know, things can be doctored. You know, somebody could say this is breaking and it may not be breaking. So how do we verify and know this is real? So there, there's a lot of thought being given to how do, we, how do we measure that? How do we figure that out? with the technology. And also there's a need for skilled people who understand how to tell the story in a responsible way so that we as citizens can make good decisions because we have good information in our lives. And I think that's absolutely an essential part of any democracy. So I'm, again, I'm optimistic that, that journalism will survive. I'm not sure who will be telling those stories, who will mm -hmm. be writing those pieces in the future, and what new streams of, you know, what new platforms will exist, and who all the players are, because it's much more complicated now. Yeah. Oh, good, I've got two, I was gonna say something. So, um, a lady at the back, and then there's another person the same, nearly in the same row, and a gentleman in the front. Please. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if this is working. Can't quite hear you at the moment. No, is it turned try, on? Try again. It's one of those mics. I think that if you speak into it, it will speak up. Hello. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's on, but I'm sure you can all hear me. There you go. There um, okay, now it's on. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to follow up on something that was said earlier about, um, like, I guess, yeah, about you know the use of Twitter and how that affects media and et cetera. And I, I really related to what you were saying about it um, and to, I guess one of the things that for me is important about this work is that it asks questions about not whether information is available only, but about um, how much information there is to pay attention to and being in this weird time when people's attention spans are increasingly diminished and this kind of interaction of, you know, if we can, if we can even call it that, like this kind of media of, um, you know, using Twitter or using Facebook or whatever, these different means online, um, is also, uh, it's coded like C-O-A-T-E-D with like corporate, like, typifications of people and then that's then used to like kind of reify the organ the more maybe organic ways in which um, in which social activity and creativity may have developed in the past a lot of that kind of organic like flow has been taken away where you do get oh, if you like this story, look at this story, or, or maybe, maybe we'll just create that you, this type, likes the story, because we'll just put it there, you know? And so this kind of embeddedness and this kind of insidious getting into, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's the big sort okay. of thing about public and private, right? Like, how, how does that affect us? Uh, yeah, like, we sort of, we, we, withdraw into our own biases and we surround ourselves with Twitter followers who agree with what we agree with and we, you know, and if we don't, we're just talking to them to get into a fight. And, and so it, I, I've read, I feel like at least several news articles about this, about how our politics are increasingly polarized because the technologies that we use are creating these ways that we can live in these bubbles and not actually have to interact with people who don't agree with us because if you like this, then you'll like this. If you follow this person on Twitter, find this other person who also agrees with you and you can all have this either conservative bubble or liberal bubble or whatever bubble you might be living in. I'm not sure if that gets to, to what you were saying or not, but that, that was the first thing that sprung to my mind. And I liked what you said too about the reification, right? Like it's almost as if, like I don't know, Twitter in some ways I, I love and hate, like I'm on it a lot and I feel like I can interact with people, like the barriers are down. Like, you know, sometimes you can talk to people you would never have access to, but it's also not really a natural experience and you lose some of that human component of actually having a conversation with someone that may be a little bit boring at times and you just push through it because that's what you do when you talk to somebody <laughs> and it doesn't have to be, everything doesn't have to be efficient. And so we start to like have our human interactions with people and expect it to behave by the same rules that the technology realm is and so we're all just kind of like jerks, right? <laughs> like we just want it to be quick. Okay, yeah, thanks. It's, you see.
Is that good? Oh, good. wow, that's, that's too good. So I'm actually torn which question to ask, because I, I grew up in Bath and Bristol in the late 80s and early 90s, so I, I felt like there was like two conversations going on. There's like people who knew Bristol in the early 90s. I, um, uh, but I also work in the media, so I'm, I'm kind of torn which, uh, which route to go. I think, I, I think I'm going to make a comment slash question uh, about okay. the media. Um, and it goes to what people were saying uh, about the, the, the kind of the war for attention in the saturated landscape. And I think we spend, you know, we spend a lot of time worrying about how we're being controlled um, by media. And, you know, there's great luminaries who's devoted their whole lives to worrying about it, Noam Chomsky and people like that, right? And um, when you see how content is actually manufactured on the shop floor, um, to me, it, you have a very different perspective, which is um, it's kind of just holding up a mirror to ourselves that everybody knows that if you engage the, the kind of fight or flight human reflex with your headline writing, mm. you, will, you will get easy traction. And so that will always fly. <laughs> And it will fly more and more in a highly saturated marketplace where you're trying to quote unquote break through. So it's like, well, how do I break through? Well, I, no matter how, I've been in meetings where we've literally talked about where we've got this really smart intellectual piece and we're just going to write some tabloidy gotcha headline because <laughs> we're not going to get our numbers. And so I think we should stop worrying about the evil others trying to. <laughs> Um, control our consciousness and start thinking about what we click on or choose to read. I think it's, I, I hate, I'm going to sound like a bad, like, I don't know, Republican congressman now saying it's all about personal responsibility. And, and, but, 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 uh, and that's not my intention, but, 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 but there is an element of um, a lot of this is holding a mirror to ourselves in terms of what the content that we choose to, to engage in. And a lot of the control mechanisms um, uh, that people see as control mechanisms are, are actually very willing. Everyone's a very willing participant in the control mechanism. And yeah, you, you have to true. choose not to participate if you wish to no longer participate. And that takes hard work. And our lives are so comfortable, we can't be bothered to do the hard work, I well, think. There's so, one yeah. thing I just. I, I, well, everybody if, wants to come back sure. with you on that. OK, thanks. <laughs> If, if, if you haven't heard of him, there's a man named Moxie Marlin Spike, and he wrote a response to the NSA leaks that was basically why, uh, if you're not doing anything wrong, if you shouldn't worry, is the wrong way to think about surveillance. And it speaks to this idea that we're all making these choices, and we should just stop making these choices. And he has this really great lecture that he gave called Gmail is not a choice. And his basic point is we could all choose not to have a cell phone, but society, there's this something called the no network problem. Whereas if you're not using something that has a network of people that are also using it, you're all by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so using a cell phone is no longer about whether or not you want to carry it around, but whether or not you want to participate in society because society has changed the way it behaves. Because we used to make a plan to meet at a certain day at a certain time and we would stick to it. And now we all have phones and so we can change it at any time. It's just like, oh, I'll call you after work. And so I, I hear what you're saying about not clicking on the like side boob link or whatever, but I don't think that it's as simple as that when it comes to something like whether or not you use Gmail or whether or not you use Twitter. Because even if you don't use Gmail and you use Rise Up and you make that personal choice, you cannot talk to anyone else that uses Gmail. And so I think that we do have agency in some sense about what headlines we click on and whether we read those meaty stories, but then there are other places where society has moved on and we... I think... Yeah. Okay. I, think that, I think that we have a real crisis because the metrics used to value the, the, the good journalism skew us more towards the tabloidy headlines and the tabloidy stories. I know for a fact that I, I used to work for a, a business news magazine, and we had somebody who would do slideshows all the time on, online and you know, feature you know, how to renovate your bathroom. And this was, not a hard, this was not a franchise that this business we were, magazine was doing. But when they put it up, Yahoo would pick it up, and it was sort of a Martha Stewart type thing, and it would get five million hits, and it encourages you to go into this very different direction that's not the core of what you're all about. And I think that that's been, you know, hits the way we measure success. 
or the way advertisers force the news business to measure success is problematic. And I do believe it's going to change. Because I do believe that people want, you know, that you, ha you can value a smaller audience who wants to get this stuff and doesn't want to read and click on the Martha Stewart toilet story. Mm -hmm. and, but they are smart. They are people that you may want to be advertising in front of. And it may not be a million clicks. So now I, I've just seen technology where now you can see how far somebody's read into a story. Hmm. And that might be a measure of, well, you know, are you going to, you know, 10, 7, 8 paragraphs into the story and really, really looking at it? Um, you know, there, I'm not saying that that's a perfect solution, but I'm just saying that I, I, I think the advertising environment's so confused now, and I don't think they've quite gotten it. And that's why the business model for journalism is so incredibly broken. But I'm, I'm... Yes, because, I mean, social media is doing the job that advertising used to do, essentially, now, isn't it? Well, yeah, to, to some degree it is, and, or they're advertising on social media instead yeah. of in the New York... ...combination of something, it was a message, pound, 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 like a corporate advertisement, as far as I'm concerned. Imagine if they could sell Cheerios that way, you know, with a huge room full of docile computers and the message pounding into them. It made me wonder if it was kind of a joke. Somebody alluded to that early in the yeah. discussion. I thought it was a very interesting performance. I really did enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But I said, is this a joke at heart? Is, this, is, is he trying to show us what he's talking about or what? Mm -hmm. mm. And you're standing, too. So you're sort of getting tired as, as it goes on. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe he's trying to make you feel the way that he wants you to feel about being controlled by data, like exactly. physically as you watch it. As a lot, oh, as I'm Morris overwhelmed. Said, it's ironic. I'm overstimulated. Yeah. There's too many lights flashing in my face. I'm tired. But Massive Attack is awesome. <laughs> I don't know. I think there's also <laughs> some of his own personal frustration at this constant, uh, you know, the, the inability of things to, to change. So I said that's why I think there's a lot of anger in it, and that comes out in the, in the power of the soundtrack. Yeah, I think it is, there is a kind of performative contradiction in the performance, mm. which is, is, is interesting, well, and can't have escaped their attention. Yeah. Okay, well, wh whatever your view of it, if you're going to see it tonight, it certainly won't leave you without thoughts, I think. <laughs> oh, you have to be, and um, I think I'm, uh, Joyce was saying earlier about uh, you, you, you actually are the only optimist on the panel. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think I'm slightly more optimistic now as a result of having listened to, to all of you this evening. Because I, I begin to think that the, 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 there are other ways. And I think there are, you know, the power of individuals now, uh, the, the increasing um, inability of governments to govern is actually maybe not such a bad thing. And that actually we may find other ways through the solutions. That's not intended to be a facile, a Voltairean conclusion that everything will be all right. But um, Best maybe of all there possible are worlds. <laughs> But maybe, maybe there is hope. Anyway, if you're going to see the work tonight, uh, do go in for a stiff drink afterwards because you'll need it. <laughs> and in the meantime, for those of you who've seen the work, you can go off for a stiff drink now, as I'm going to do. <laughs> um, and to those of you online, thanks very much for sticking with us. And if you've gone off to sleep during the, the uh, debate, then you can pick it up where you left off online tomorrow. In the meantime, thank you to the Armoury for hosting us. Thank you to Simon, Joyce, and Alexis. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. You want the mic? I thought that was probably a reasonable moment to wrap up. No, that was beautiful. <laughs>